chapter twenty two of the three midshipmen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording done by jules harlock of mississauga ontario canada the three midshipmen by william henry giles kingston chapter twenty two prisoners battles and wounds death and destruction and all the other concomitants of warfare may be interesting matters to read about but the reality is very far from pleasant or desirable even jack rogers and paddy adair could not help coming to this conclusion during the night they spent off loggles surrounded by their wounded and dead and dying companions they were also not a little anxious about murray of whom they could obtain no information the stars kept shining forth from the dark sky the surface of the river was smooth as glass on either side around them was the squadron of steamers and boats while in the distance could be observed the lights of the black city from which every now and then a flash might be seen as a negro took it into his head to fire off a musket or perhaps while handling it let it explode unintentionally at length daylight returned directly everybody was on the alert but as yet no signal was made to recommence the attack whatever heroes of romance might have done modern warriors require rest and refreshment so the men set to work to cook and eat their breakfasts while this was going on a boat was seen approaching the squadron she was the gig murray commanded he himself was on board his shipmates warmly welcomed him where have you been what have you been about we feared you were lost exclaimed several voices it is a somewhat long story he answered after the retreat was ordered yesterday i saw some negroes pulling off in a canoe to the northward of the island and not thinking of consequences i pursued them away we went at good speed but they paddled faster it did not occur to me at the time that they were making their escape from the town when i looked astern i found that our own boats had gone to the southward and that between me and them was the large body of native canoes to attempt to pass them would have been madness so i pulled on up the river the blacks were so engaged in the fight that i was not perceived i therefore pulled up the stream till it was dark and then lay hid for some time to rest and refresh my men i bethought me that having got thus far i would employ myself profitably i therefore dropped an anchor and let the men take a couple of hours sleep then once more getting under way i dropped down sounding as i came and passed right round to the west of the island when abreast of it i saw dark objects moving across the channel and found that they were canoes crossing and recrossing and i have no doubt carrying out household goods and other property and perhaps some of the inhabitants were making their escape at all events it looks as if the natives were not very sanguine of success i had to wait till i had an opportunity of threading my way between them and it was only just at daybreak that i was able to get clear i must now go and make my report to the captain not long after this the signal was given to attack and the whole squadron was quickly in movement there was not a man engaged who was not resolved to redeem if possible the loss of the previous day the boats as before pulled round to the northward where the houses of the king and his prime ministers as well as of the european slave dealers were situated while the steamers took up positions on either side of the town there was no mistake this time as what was to be done 
the sad loss of life which occurred on the previous day arose it must be remembered entirely in consequence of the grounding of the steamer this made it necessary to land in the face of a hot fire and to storm the stockades while it also brought about the subsequent disasters the signal was given and the steamers and boats opened a steady and well-directed fire which soon began to tell house after house was seen to be in flames the blacks returned it but with a very different spirit to the previous day they had fancied after the apparent defeat the english had suffered on the previous day they would not again venture to attack them steadily the boats fired away hurrah 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 a loud cheer ran through the line a shot had entered the house of tapis kosoko's prime minister and set it on fire he was one of the most determined supporters of the slave trade and the chief instigator of the first attack on the boats of the squadron soon after the gun in the battery below his house was capsized while the men working it were driven out by a well-directed rocket sent among them house after house now caught fire most of the non-combatants had before this fled the rest were next seen hurriedly making their escape with cries of terror and dismay still the garrison with a bravery worthy of a better cause held out the firing on both sides became more rapid but the english redoubled their exertions shower of shot and shell and rockets were flying into the devoted town suddenly a fearful roar was heard earth and stones and fragments of timber mixed with human forms were seen to rise up into the air one of the enemy's chief magazines had exploded from that moment the conflagration extended more rapidly and fiercely than before till the whole city appeared to be in a blaze the flames rising up in ruddy pyramids and supporting a dark canopy overhead a fit funeral pall for those who had fallen in the strife there could be no longer any doubt that the fate of lagos was decided a broad creek ran through the part of the town this stopped the flames kosoko's house was still standing a boat was directed especially to destroy it but the commander of the expedition influenced by truly christian motives resolved before doing more injury to the town to give kosoko an opportunity of capitulating the next day was sunday he resolved should the blacks commit no act of hostility to make it also a day of rest recalling all the boats he sent in therefore a flag of truce by a friendly chief to kosoko allowing him till monday morning to consider his proposals once more therefore on saturday evening the squadron retired from before the town but very different were the feelings of those engaged from what they had been on friday now success appeared certain then a heavy loss and defeat had been the termination of their day's labor still as the three midshipmen men on board jack's boat their conversation was far sadder than it was wont to be so probably was that of the commanders of the expedition to think that we should have spent all this time before a town fortified only by slaving rascals and manned by blacks and after all not yet to be masters of it exclaimed jack with some bitterness in his tone it comes very much of the common english fault of despising our enemies observed murray we are apt to forget that though fellows have black or tawny skins they have got brains in their heads still we don't often find enemies who have the pluck of britons said adair no and that is the reason why we are ultimately so generally successful answered murray 
but that does not prevent us from frequently in the first place meeting with defeat and disgrace and losing numberless valuable lives i do not mean to say that what had happened on friday could have been avoided but it is very sad to think of the poor fellows who have lost their lives as well as of the many now suffering from their wounds so we won't talk more about the matter that night passed like the former ones and sunday was gliding tranquilly away spent in most instances by the crews on board the vessels and boats after the example of the commander as a sunday should be passed when it was ascertained that the usurper and his prime minister and the greater number of his troops had abandoned the city the english commander therefore sent to direct the negro auxiliaries who had accompanied king akioe from abikuta to escort him into the city and to install him in his office this was done and they took possession of the houses which had escaped the conflagration while a small portion only of the british forces entered that evening and spiked the guns in the chief batteries turned towards the river the next morning fifty-two guns were destroyed or embarked murray was among those who went on shore in his letter home he made the following remarks the greater part of the stronghold of slavery is now a little more than a heap of ashes but enough of the works remain to show the cunning methods devised by the blacks for entrapping us into ambushes had we assaulted it in truth the place is a great deal stronger than we had any notion of one thing i must say that in spite of the reverses we had first experienced every officer and man engaged in the affair did his utmost and behaved as british seamen always should behave and it must be the consolation of the relations and the friends of the gallant fellows who lost their lives that a very important work has been performed and that the capture of this stronghold of slave trade will prove one of the severest blows that hateful traffic has ever experienced it has done much also i trust to advance the cause of religion and civilization in africa and will help i hope to wipe away the dark stain which is attached to many of the so-called christian nations of the world akitoi is now installed king of lagos he professes great friendship for the english as well as for the people of abiokuta if he proves the stern enemy of the slave trade and the true friend of christianity we shall not have fought in vain on searching for the spanish and the portuguese slave dealers by whom the lagos people had been trained to arms none were to be found they had fled and as their property was completely destroyed they have never since returned the midshipmen heard that their old acquaintance don diego was one of those who had establishments there but they could not hear anything of him nor what had become of the felucia on board of which he was last seen one thing was very certain that is love for the english generally or for them in particular could not have been increased when he found that all his property in lagos had been destroyed the squadron at length once more put to sea and lagos has ever since virtually been under the jurisdiction of the british government who retained it for the purpose of keeping in check the traffic in slaves the frigate had been some weeks at sea before she at length fell in with the archer which murray had then to rejoin all three of the midshipmen were beginning to look forward to the time when they might hope once more to return to england still they were perfectly content till the time arrived steadily to go on in the performance of their duty when murray left the frigate he took with him his two parrots polly and nelly but queerface remained 
and adair declared that under his judicious system of education he had become one of the most learned and sagacious of monkeys he said that it reminded him very much of don diego and so he and jack amused themselves by rigging him out in a dress similar to that in which they had seen the old don appear the imitation was so good that the moment queer face sprang up on the deck the likeness was recognized by all who saw him when adair went away in boats he usually took queer face with him to afford amusement to his men the frigate had been for some time cruising on southward without meeting with any success when there being every appearance of calm weather captain lascelles ordered away two of the boats to cruise in search of slavers one to the northward and the other to the southward jack to his great satisfaction got command of the penance and adair who would otherwise have remained on board volunteered to accompany him with queer face to make sport for the crew dick needham was also of the party away they pulled to the northward and before sunset they were out of sight of the ship we must have a prize somehow or other cried adair it will never do to return without one just such as one as you and i took in the mediterranean when we first went to sea said jack laughing however we'll do our best what do you say to it master queerface there sat the monkey in the stern sheets dressed in a broad-brimmed straw hat nankeen trousers a light blue jacket and a red neckcloth just as don diego had appeared when jack had last seen him queerface seemed in no way to disapprove of the hat and jacket but his lower garments at times somewhat puzzled him however he altogether behaved himself very well there was so little wind that jack did not even step his masts he thus hoped to get close to any slaver should he see one without being discovered he had his trusty rifle ready and from frequently practising he was even a better shot than before adair had picked up a very fair rifle at sierra leone but he could not pretend to equal jack as a shot they both well knew that they could not hope to take a prize without exerting themselves and they were therefore constantly standing up and looking about on all sides in search of a sail they were off a part of the coast whence numerous cargoes of slaves were still embarked a short time before sunset they made the land soon after this as jack was standing up on the stern sheets his eyes fell on a white spark glistening brightly in the oblique rays of the departing luminary he brought his glass to bear on the subject adair took a look at it and so did needham they all agreed that the sail in sight was a square top sail schooner standing off the land then she must pass close to us cried jack we'll be on watch for her another look they all took before the sun sank below the horizon confirmed them in this opinion the last few hours of daylight were spent by the crew in examining their pistols in seeing that their cutlasses were ready at hand and everything prepared for boarding at a moment's notice all hands then turned to and had a good supper after which as they said they were up to anything the boat floated quietly on the almost calm waters for though the men lay on their oars they did not pull a stroke not a word was spoken above the lowest whisper there were sounds for the ocean itself is never even in a calm altogether silent even and anon there was a splash sometimes caused by the boat as a smooth undulation rose up as it seemed from the depths below and made her roll lazily for an instant from side to side or some fish rose to the surface with wide open mouths or leaped up into the air or one of the monsters of the unfathomed waters came to have a gaze at the strange thing which floated over their liquid home a slight mist came over the land with the night air damp and unwholesome enough 
but jack and terence little regarded that point as it contributed much to conceal the boat from the approaching stranger though they had little doubt that her more lofty sails would easily be seen above it time passed on they calculated that the schooner must be drawing near them once more jack stood up there she is he whispered as he sank into his seat away to the northward out oars lads as gently as possible in ten minutes we shall be alongside of her the oars had been muffled and with a long steady strokes made by the men scarcely a splash was heard they might well hope to be up to the stranger without being discovered on glided the boat it was an exciting moment the sails of a large topsail schooner rose up out of the mist before them jack and adair thought they saw a little beyond her the pointed tops of another craft slowly moving over the bank of fog if they should prove enemies there would be fearful odds against them they numbered only eleven people in all eight pulling needham and themselves still they did not hesitate we'll take one and then be ready for the other whispered jack adair nodded his assent still discretion might have been the best part of valour in this case that further craft is a felucia again whispered jack i can see the tops of her latent sails above the mist perhaps she's the old don's craft never mind we'll be ready for him in two minutes more they were close up to the schooner no notice had hitherto been taken of them by those on board they flattered themselves that they were not perceived they dashed alongside who are you who are you said a fierce voice in spanish speak speak who are you a boat of her britannic majesty's ship ranger answered jack who understood what was said heave to i want to come on board you he said this as the boat was hooking on and he and terence followed by their men were about to spring on deck when again the same person who had before hailed sang out heave heave sink the boat sink the boat and the scoundrel heretics have no mercy on them at that instant down came half a dozen round shots into the bottom of the boat rattling through the planks while pistols were fired in their faces and pikes were thrust at them and swords flourished above their heads they were prepared for opposition so in spite of this cutlass in hand they sprang up the side of the vessel without much difficulty as her bulwarks were low and attacked their assailants jack had time to seize his rifle for he saw the water rushing into his boat and he felt that she was sinking under their feet followed by queerface who though fright chattered away louder than ever the english seaman gained the deck of the slaver such undoubtedly she was if not worse jack saw that they had nearly taken her by surprise for but few men were at that moment on deck but others some only half dressed were rushing out of both the fore and after cabins the first who had received them made so bold a stand that time was allowed for the whole of the spanish crew to assemble they far outnumbered the english still the gallant young midshipmen and their followers fought on undaunted suddenly queerface who had hitherto kept behind the rest jumped up into the rigging and looked over them diego don diego cried several of the slavers crew come he to be with these men there must be some mistake quacko 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 cried queerface and scud up the rigging out of harm's way the spaniards could not make it out the delay however was an advantage to the english as it enabled them to cast their eyes around and see the state of affairs the greater number of their enemies were forward so jack and most of his party sprang on in that direction hoping to dispose of them first the fellows stood their ground firing their pistols and flourishing their swords and two of the english were shot 
and jack got an ugly cut across his shoulder still he pressed on and compelled at length the spanish to take refuge in their cabin under the top-gallant forecastle meantime terence was keeping the slavers captain and officers in check but he had lost a man who was struck to the deck and needham too was wounded matters were going very hard with jack and his followers still ten british seamen might well have hoped to conquer the whole of a slaver's crew the fight had now become desperate the spanish captain had probably all his fortunes embarked in the venture jack and his party had to struggle for life and liberty again and again they made desperate rushes at the after part of the vessel and at length they pushed the spaniards so hard that they almost drove them overboard when two sails were seen emerging from out of the fog and gliding up alongside in another instance not queerface but the veritable don diego himself was seen to spring on board followed by a dozen or more villainous-looking ruffians what's all this what's all this his harsh croaking voice was heard shouting in spanish down with the english pirates down with them hearing the cry the spaniards who had taken refuge forward rushed out again and though jack called the terence to fight to the last and that they would sell their lives dearly they found themselves literally borne down by numbers and their cutlasses whirled out of their hands we have done our best paddy we can do no more exclaimed jack as he and terence found themselves standing side by side with their hands secured and lashed to the mainmast needham and the rest of the people who were able to move were treated in the same way why my friend you were very nearly captured by these picaroons they heard don diego remark to the other spanish captain but where is a lantern let me see whom we have caught the lantern was brought and the don came round and held it up to their faces ha ha he exclaimed with the most sardonic grin your obedient humble servant gentlemen i told you we should meet again and we have met what do you expect after all the tricks you have played me neither jack nor terence deigned a reply ah speak pirates he exclaimed stamping furiously on the deck the yard-arm a sharp knife or a walk on the plank whichever you like i grant you your choice still neither of the midshipmen would reply what was the use of so doing we must kill every one of them exclaimed the don speaking in spanish turning to the other captain i have a long account to settle with these english generally and these lads especially they have been the cause of nearly all my losses they cannot repay me but i can take my revenge and that is something certainly certainly my friend answered the other you can hang or drown or shoot them as you think fit it is a matter of perfect indifference to me these were the last words poor jack heard as the two worthies entered the cabin we are in a bad case jack i'm afraid said adair though i could not exactly make out what the fellow said it was not pleasant answered jack briefly terence have you ever thought of dying yes i have that is to say i have known that i was running many a chance of being knocked on the head or finished in some way or other answered adair with some little hesitation then terence my dear fellow let us look at it as an awful reality which is about speedily to overtake us said jack solemnly these fellows threaten to at once take our lives depend on it they will put their threats into execution it's hard to bear jack dear replied adair i'm so sorry for you and for all your brothers and sisters at home i don't think mine care much for me that's one comfort 
but i say i wish that the blackguards would let us have our arms free that we might still have a fight for our lives don't speak thus terence said jack who was almost overcome by adair's allusion to his family don't let us think of the past but keep our thoughts fixed on the future world we are about to enter and think how very unfit we are of ourselves for the glorious place we would wish to go to terence listened and responded in the same tone to his messmate much more they said to the same effect nor did they forget to offer up their prayers for preservation from the terrible danger which threatened them then with the calmness of christians and brave men they awaited the doom they believed prepared for them such consolation as they could give also they offered to the survivors of their crew two poor fellows had been killed outright another was bleeding to death on the deck nor would the brutal spaniards offer him the slightest assistance while they prevented his shipmates from giving it to him jack himself was suffering all so much pain from his wound while he felt so faint from loss of blood that he could scarcely support himself he had told needham that the spaniards threatened to kill them all well sir they may do it if they dare but they will be sure to be caught some day or other answered needham i wouldn't change places with them we shall die having done our duty they will be hung up like dogs if i knew their lingo i would tell them so the english were not long left in quiet so many of the spaniards had been wounded that some time was spent by them in bandaging up their hurts and as soon as this was done they came on deck eager to wreak their vengeance on their captive foes they now came about them with their long knives flourishing them before their eyes and pretending to stab at them some indeed more brutal than the rest actually struck their knives into their flesh but though blood was drawn the seamen generally disdained even to utter a word though one or two said i'll tell you what you villains if i can get my fists at the liberty i'll give it to you at length don diego and the captain of the schooner came out from the cabin they had apparently made up their minds what to do the latter gave orders to reeve ropes to each yard-arm while planks were got up and placed over the sides secured on board by lanyards on these being cut of course the end of the plank overboard would instantly sink down and let the person standing on it into the water don diego had it seemed taken upon himself the direction of the executions jack and adair had supposed that the spaniards would wait till the morning to kill them but the little don evidently had no wish to delay his vengeance cast the prisoners loose and bring them aft he cried out now you scoundrel heretics what have you got to say for yourself nothing i thought so well i'll be merciful you shall choose the mode of your death what shall it be will you be hung or walk the plank there are plenty of sharks alongside who will be happy to entomb you either way no one replied to this address speak you heretics he cried out stamping with rage the two midshipmen cast their eyes about them to assure themselves that what was taking place was a reality the whole scene appeared so like some horrid dream that they could scarcely believe it true as they looked up they discovered that a strong breeze had sprung up and that the vessel was moving rapidly through the water the deck was crowded with seamen many of whom held lanterns so that the whole ship was lighted it is time to begin cried the don come as you will not choose for yourselves i must choose for you here seize that lad and run him up to the mainyard arm he pointed at adair several of the ruffian crew rushed forward and seized poor terence 
and dragged him up to the rope which hung from the yard arm they were about to take hold of it to adjust it around adair's neck when down by it came gliding an apparition which in the uncertain light cast by the lanterns aloft looked so like old don diego himself that the superstitious spaniards believing that it was his wraith or ghost let go the rope and sprang back to the other side of the vessel the old don was not less astonished than the rest but not exactly recognizing himself it occurred to him that some spirit of evil had come on board to watch his proceedings queer face meantime for the apparition was no other than him seeing the confusion he had created shinned up the rope again and on reaching the yard-arm finding it slack hauled it up after him and there he sat chattering away and wondering what the strangers were going to do to his master the wicked old don though astonished at first was not altogether overcome and soon recovering himself began to get an idea of the true state of the case once more he ordered the crew to go on with their cruel work but no one would venture aloft to overhaul the whip and queer face showed no disposition to help them the don began to swear and stamp with rage calling them all by certain uncomplimentary epithets in which the spanish language is so rich the crew swore and abused him in return in the midst of the confusion a voice hailed them through a speaking trumpet what schooner is that heave to or i will fire into you we are in the hands of a set of bloody pirates i'm jack rogers sang out jack at the top of his voice never had he sung out louder take that for speaking exclaimed the little don levelling a pistol at his head he pulled the trigger it misfired and before he could again cock the lock needham who had been working his hands free sprang aft and with a blow of his fist levelled him with the deck it was the signal for the spaniards to set upon them and they would all have been cut down but the next instant a loud crash was heard and the dark hull of a man-of-war brig with her taunt masts and wide spread of canvas was seen ranging up alongside the next instant twenty or more stout english seamen led by alec murray came pouring down on the slaver's deck the brig which had thus providentially fallen in with them was the archer she was on her passage to the northward with dispatches for captain lascelles recalling him and his frigate homewards the news was received by all hands with unmitigated joy the tables on board the schooner were quickly turned the spaniards were all handcuffed and a strict guard set over them the midshipmen and their followers went on board the brig where they were cordially welcomed and their wounds looked to the felucia escaped but as she was never again heard of it was supposed that she was lost in a fierce gale which occurred two days afterwards the schooner was found to be full of slaves and proved to be a rich prize don diego escaped hanging but was reduced to an abject beggary for he had not even the means of leaving sierra a leone and very soon afterwards was found dead on the beach this was the last adventure either of the three midshipmen met with on the coast of africa they were all three pretty well tired of it and delighted indeed were they when they once more found themselves in sight of the old england the frigate and the brig were paid off about the same time and alec and terence accompanied jack to that often talked of and well-loved home of his in northamptonshire it must not be forgotten that they had in their train the most sensible of travelled apes master queerface who by his amusing antics and performances and extraordinary monkeyish sagacity 
gained the admiration of the whole surrounding neighborhood there they remained for some weeks when after alex and terence had paid a short visit to their own friends they were all at once more summoned afloat end of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of the three midshipmen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by gillian hendry the three midshipmen by william henry giles kingston chapter twenty three bound for china her majesty's frigate dugong was fitted with all dispatch for sea at portsmouth so was her majesty's brig of war blenny just commissioned by commander hemming well known as the papers stated for his gallantry on the coast of africa and on every occasion when he had an opportunity of displaying it the papers spoke truly and well had our old friend won his present rank both the frigate and the brig were destined it was supposed for the china seas but this was not known to a certainty the dugong had been commissioned by captain grant alec murray's old commander in the archer who had some short time before received his post rank captain lascelles with whom the three midshipmen first went to sea commanded at this time a line of battle ship on the indian station who has not heard of the blue posts at portsmouth to be found not far from the landing place known as the point now sadly encroached on by new batteries and a broad wooden pier one afternoon at the time of which i am speaking a cab stopped at the door of that well-known inn with a portmanteau outside and a cocked hat case a sword a gun case and several other articles including a young naval officer inside he nodded smilingly to the waiter and boots who came to get out his things as to old acquaintances and then having paid the cabman entered the inn no sooner had he put his head into the coffee room than another young officer in the uniform of a mate or past midshipman jumped up and seizing him by the hand exclaimed i am delighted to see you my dear jack you've come to join the dugong i hope if you belong to her adair i wish i was answered jack rogers for he was the newcomer but i am not the fact is hemming has got command of the blenny and i applied and got appointed to her it can't be helped now any news of murray he wrote me word some little time ago that he expected to get appointed to a ship i wish that i could have had him with me but we three have been on the same station and mostly together all our lives and we can scarcely expect the same good fortune to continue we tried to keep together and we succeeded answered adair there's nothing like trying in my opinion you're right there old fellow there isn't a doubt of it exclaimed jack rogers who had been a little out of spirits and inclined to take a somewhat gloomy view of affairs in general no wonder for he had just left as happy a home as any to be found in old england it was a cold march day too and he was chilled with his journey he took off his greatcoat which with his other things boots carried to his room and then the two old messmates sat down before the fire they had been talking on for some time while their dinner was getting ready when adair observed a young man sitting at a table a little way off narrowly observing them terence looked at him in return do you know jack i do verily believe that there sits no other than bully pigeon he whispered what can he be doing down here the stranger seeing them looking at him got up and approaching them with his hand extended said what do i see some old friends rogers adair very glad to see you how do you do how do you do you remember me surely i'm pigeon thus addressed it would not have been in the nature of either of the two midshipmen to have refused to shake hands with their old schoolfellow bully though he had been they invited him to join them and when they had dined they all three sat over their wine together talking merrily of former days i'm going out to china in the diplomatic line observed pigeon in his old tone i have a notion that i shall be able to manage the celestials there are few people who can deceive me these and a few other similar remarks showed that pigeon in one respect was little changed from what he had been in his early days when or how he was going out to china he did not say they had been chatting away for some time when another cab rattled up to the inn 
and presently at the door of the coffee-room who should appear, to the delight of Rogers and Adair, but Murray himself. They dragged him into the room, each eager to know what ship he was come to join. Paddy gave a shout of delight when he heard that he was appointed to the Dugong. He told them besides that she was certainly under orders for China, to sail as soon as ready for sea, and that the Blenny was also to be sent there. The old schoolfellows, as may be supposed, passed a very pleasant evening, their pleasure being heightened with the anticipation of being together in whatever work they might be engaged. Even Bully Pigeon was sufferable, as Paddy observed, if he was not altogether agreeable. He had a number of strange adventures to narrate, of which he was the hero. Although his accounts were not implicitly believed, it was agreed that, at all events, they were possible, which was somewhat in his favour. Two weeks after this, Her Majesty's ships Dugong and Blenny were gliding under all sail across the Bay of Biscay. "'The frigate looks something like a dowager, with her small daughter following in her wake, sir,' observed Jack, glancing his eye from the brig to her big consort as he walked to the deck with his captain. "'We must try and make the little daughter win a name for herself out among the Celestials,' said Captain Hemming in return. "'That we will, sir, if we get the chance,' answered Jack. "'Aye, Rogers, but we must make the chance,' remarked his captain with emphasis. "'So we will, sir,' said Jack warmly. "'There is not a man on board who'll not be glad of it.' Captain Hemming had a sincere regard and respect for Jack, as Jack had for him. They had both seen each other well tried and never found wanting, and they could thus converse frankly and without reserve. Neither Hemming nor Jack were people to talk without fully intending to perform. Indeed, those who knew them felt sure that when dash or cool courage or perseverance and intelligence were especially required, they would show that they possessed them all. Jack liked his ship and most of his brother officers, as well as his captain, and was a general favourite with them. He had brought two companions, Adair's old African follower, Queerface, which he had given to Jack, and a fine Newfoundland dog, Sancho by name. Jack had intended leaving Queerface at home, as Paddy remarked, to remind his brothers and sisters of him. The compliment was somewhat doubtful, but the monkey had played so many curious tricks and had committed so much mischief that no one would undertake the charge of him, and therefore, like a bad boy, he was sent off to sea again in disgrace. As was natural, Sancho and Queerface became very intimate, though not at the same time perfectly friendly. Each, it appears, was striving for the mastery. Queerface, monkey though he was, gained the day, and one of his great amusements was to mount Sancho's back, and to make him run round and round the deck with him, whipping him on and chattering away all the time, most vociferously, to the great amusement of the seamen, if not always to that of the first lieutenant. Jack had another charge to look after, a young midshipman, Harry Bevan by name, who had been especially committed to his charge. The little fellow had been a petted, somewhat spoilt child, an only son, yet go to sea he would, and his parents never had refused him anything, so they let him have his will, though it almost broke their hearts. Jack promised to take the best care of him he could. Harry was not exactly a pickle, but he had very little notion of taking care of himself, so Jack had quite enough to do to look after him, in addition to Queerface and Sancho. Harry and Sancho were very great friends, but Queerface evidently looked upon him as a rival in his master's affection, and bore him no good will. This feeling of the monkey was increased by the tricks which the young midshipman played him whenever he had the opportunity. At last he was never able to approach Queerface without a rope in his hand, which he held behind his back, or doubled up in his pocket. The monkey, in the most sagacious way, would skip about till he had ascertained whether the weapon was there or not. If it was there, as soon as he caught sight of it, he would spring up into the rigging, and sit on a ratline, as quiet and demure as a judge, without attempting to retaliate. On board the frigate there was little to interrupt the usual routine. Murray had carried one of his parrots with him, and the sagacious bird afforded almost as much amusement as did Bully Pigeon, who soon showed that he was very little altered from what he had been in his youth. He could not bully, but he could give abundant evidence of being still an arrant donkey. Pigeon now called himself a philosopher, and used to be very fond of broaching his philosophical principles, as he denominated his nonsense. One day, while dining in the gun-room, 
he began as usual. As he drank his wine, he grew bolder and bolder in his assertions. At last he declared that he did not believe that there was a place of punishment after death. He had taken it into his head that the surgeon would side with him. I'm sure, doctor, a sensible man like you will not assert that such is a fact, he continued. What use would there be in it? I'll tell you what, my laddie. There's one very good use it will be put to, and that will be to stow away all such vicious, ignorant donkeys as you are, answered the doctor with great emphasis and deliberation. Pigeon was no way disconcerted at this somewhat powerful rebuke, but continued as before. Indeed, nothing is so difficult as to make a conceited fool cease from talking folly. At last, the first lieutenant struck his fist on the table with a force which made all the glasses ring, as he exclaimed, I'll tell you what, Mr. Pigeon, this ship belongs to a Christian queen, and while I'm the senior officer present, I'll not allow you to sneer against religion, or a word to be spoken which her gracious majesty would not approve of. Now, sir, hold your tongue, or I'll report your conduct, and have you put under arrest. The diplomatist, though looking very silly, began again, but another loud rap on the table silenced him. It did not, however, silence Murray's parrot, who had found its way, as it often did, into the cabin, and the moment the voices ceased, Polly set up such a roar of laughter that Pigeon fancied that she was laughing at him. The silly fellow's rage knew no bounds. There was, however, nothing else on which he dared to vent it, except on the loquacious bird. A bottle of port wine stood near. He seized it by the neck to throw it at Polly, who, unconscious of the coming storm, only chattered the louder. The stopper was out. As he lifted it above his head, a copious shower of the ruddy juice descended over his white shirt and waistcoat and head and face, so blinding him that he missed his aim, but broke the bottle, while Polly gave way to louder laughter than ever, in which everybody most vociferously joined. The wretched pigeon had to make his escape to his cabin to change his dress, nor did he venture out again for the rest of the day, some of the time being passed in listening to the not very complimentary remarks made upon him and his so-called philosophy. If anything would have cured him of his folly, that might have done so. He had some glimmering suspicion that he was wrong, but he had no hearty desire to be right, and when that is the case, a man is certainly in a bad way. Day after day the two ships sailed on in sight of each other. The brig was very fast, and though so much smaller, could outsail the frigate, which was not remarkable for speed. Frequently, when they were together, Polly used to take a flight to pay her old friend Queerface a visit, and he always seemed delighted to see her. He exhibited his pleasure by all sorts of antics, though he could not express what he felt so fluently with his tongue as she did. At length the Cape of Good Hope was doubled, without the flying Dutchman having been seen, though the philosopher Pigeon kept a bright lookout for him. One night he declared that he saw the phantom bark sailing right up in the wind's eye, but it was found to be only the Blenny, following the frigate under easy sail with a fair wind astern. Juan de Gaulle, in the island of Ceylon, celebrated for the rich spices it exported, and supposed to be one of the most ancient emporiums of commerce, was visited and at last the most modern and yet the largest emporium in the Indian seas, Singapore, was reached. This wonderful city, which was founded as late as 1824 by Sir Stanford Raffles, on a spot where, though formerly the site of a Malay capital, at that time but a few huts stood, is now the most wealthy and flourishing on the shores of those eastern seas. Here vessels bring produce and manufactures from all parts of the world, again to be distributed among all the neighbouring countries. There are no duties levied of any sort or description, so that people of all nations are encouraged to come there with their goods. The Chinese especially flock to the port, and great numbers are settled in the city and throughout the island, largely contributing by their persevering industry to its prosperity. Who does not know the look of a Chinese with his piggish eyes, thatched-like hat, yellow-brown skin, black tail, and wide short trousers? The streets swarmed with them, ever busy, ever toiling to collect dollars, the most industrious people under the sun, yet the least lovable or attractive. Their houses may be known by the red lintels of the doorposts, covered with curious characters and designs, while at night the persevering people may be seen still working away by the light of huge paper lanterns covered with the strangest of devices. The whole island is not larger than the Isle of Wight but already there are a hundred thousand people living on it.
collected from all quarters of the globe. There are numerous, very handsome houses in the town, mostly roofed with red brick tiles, while the higher spots in the neighbourhood are chiefly occupied by the villas of the European merchants and other principal residents. Such was the place before which Her Majesty's ships Dugong and Blenny brought up, outside a fleet of strange-looking junks, with flags of all colours, devices and shapes flying at their mastheads, while in different part of the extensive roads were ships belonging to nearly all the countries in the world, English, American and Dutch, however, predominating. Although just then the British and Chinese empires were linked in the bonds of peace, the ships of war of the former had plenty to do in keeping in order the numerous hordes of pirates which infested those seas, and considerably impeded her commerce, plundering her merchantmen, and cutting the throats of the crews whenever opportunity offered. The frigate and brig had been at Singapore but a few days when an open boat under sail was seen entering the harbour. She stood for the Blenny, which was the outer vessel. Jack Rogers, who was doing duty as officer of the watch, hailed her to know what she wanted. A glance at the condition of her crew told him more than any words could have done. Their faces were wan and bloodless, their dresses torn, and several had their heads and limbs bound up. One man sat at the helm, and another forward to manage the sail. The rest lay along the thwarts, or at the bottom of the boat, apparently more dead than alive. The boat came alongside, but no one in her had strength left to climb on board. Even the man at the helm sank back exhausted as she was made fast. Jack ordered some slings to be got ready to hoist them up, and then, taking some brandy and water in a bottle, he leaped down into the boat to administer it to the poor people. His restorative was only just in time, for many of them were already almost dead. The surgeon and most of the officers of the brig were on shore. Jack therefore signalled to the frigate to send a doctor forthwith. Dr. McCann, who had been appointed to the frigate, accompanied by Murray, soon came on board, and every possible assistance was given to the famished strangers. After some time, the man who had steered the boat recovered. He said that he was mate of a ship bound from China to the Australian colonies, and that when she was about 300 miles distant from Singapore, she had been attacked by a fleet of piratical Illinoon prahus, and her captain and crew had resisted to the utmost, but she was reduced almost to a wreck, and at night, by some accident, caught fire. The first mate was the only surviving officer. The captain and the rest, with many of the crew, had been killed by the pirates. During the darkness, the survivors made their escape unpursued, though they could see the prahus approaching the burning wreck soon after they had left her. As soon as this information was conveyed on shore, the frigate and brig were ordered to proceed to sea in search of the pirate fleet. No one was sorry to have work to do, though small amount of glory was to be obtained in pirate hunting. It's our duty, at all events, and that is one comfort, observed Jack to Adair, who had been lent to the brig in consequence of the illness of her second lieutenant. Thus two of the old schoolfellows were together. The squadron, sailing to the northward, cruised in every direction where they were likely to fall in with the piratical fleets. But though many traces of them were discovered in ruined villages and stranded vessels, the crews of which had been murdered or carried off into slavery, the pirates themselves were nowhere to be seen. At last it occurred to Captain Grant that in all probability the pirates were receiving constant information of their movements and had thus managed to elude them. He therefore determined to fit out three boats, which would, by being able to steal along shore and pull head to wind, be more likely to come on the pirates unawares. No sooner was the thought conceived than it was put into execution. Each boat was fitted with a long gun on the bows, besides swivels at the sides for closer quarters, and manned with twelve hands armed to their teeth besides officers, and in the larger boats two or three extra men. Rogers and Adair got charge of two of the boats, Murray would gladly have gone in the third with Mr. Cherry, the second lieutenant of the frigate, who had command of the expedition, but two midshipmen had already been directed to get ready to go in her, and he did not like to deprive either of them of the pleasure they anticipated. The boats did not leave the ships till some two or three hours after dark, that none of the friends of the pirates might discover what had occurred. No one expected anything but amusement from the expedition. Nat Cherry, their leader, was one of the most good-natured jolly fellows in the navy, and seldom failed to make everybody under him happy. 
they could not bring themselves to believe that a whole fleet of pirate prahus would ever wait their attack for a moment. They felt almost sure that directly they appeared, the enemy would attempt to escape. Just as Jack was shoving off from the brig, Queerface, who had been watching his opportunity, made a spring into the boat, and there was instantly a loud cry from all on board her that he might be allowed to remain. "'Oh, he's such a diverting rogue! He'll keep every mother's son of us as merry as crickets!' sang out an Irish topman, whose own humour generally proved a source of amusement to all with him. The request was granted, and Queerface seemed to enjoy the prospect of the trip as much as his companions. Away pulled the squadron of boats. When daylight dawned, they were coasting along the shore of an island, fringed with coconut trees, and hills rising in the centre. There were numerous deep indentations, bays, and gulfs, with bluff cliffs here and there, and high rocks scattered about, capital spots in which whole fleets of prahus might lie hid, without much chance of being discovered. The weather was very hot, as it is apt to be within a few miles of the equator, and when there was no wind, and the sea shone like a burnished mirror, the sun came down with very considerable force on the top of the heads of the party in the boats. Still their spirits did not flag. Jack and Adair, indeed, had been pretty well seasoned to the heat of the coast of Africa, where, if not greater, it was often far less supportable. Mr. Cherry led. Jack and Paris followed side by side. A constant fire of jokes was kept up between the two boats. Queerface evidently thought that there was something in the wind, and kept jumping about with unusual activity, keeping apparently as bright a lookout as anybody on board. Not an inlet was passed unexplored, still not a sign of the pirates could they discover. On going up one small but deepish river, they came close to the banks on a native village. The inhabitants must have taken to flight on their approach, for not a human being was to be seen. "'That looks suspicious,' exclaimed Adair. We ought to burn this village to teach them better manners. Mr. Cherry, fortunately, had no such intention. He had an idea that burning people's houses was not the best way of making friends with them. Indeed, it would be a pity to have to destroy so picturesque a place, observed Jack Rogers. The houses were mostly separate, built on piles four or five feet above the ground. They were of one story, with a deep veranda or gallery running round them a ladder leading up to it. The roofs, which were high and pointed with deep eaves, were covered with a thick coating of palm leaves, and so were the walls, while the floors were made of bamboo, cut in strips and placed nearly an inch apart, being covered with a thick, beautifully woven mat. They appeared strong, but very springy, so much so that when Adair began to dance a polka on one of them, he very nearly bounded up to the roof. The village was surrounded and interspersed with coconut and other palm trees, and with bananas, whose dark green foliage gave effect to lighter tints of the forest. The thick jungle pressed hard on every side, leaving space only here and there for some small fields and gardens. Mr. Cherry would not allow the slightest injury to be done to the houses, for though it was suspected that they belonged to the pirates, no traces of booty were to be discovered. After spending some time in examining the locality, they were about to embark when a dark visage was seen peering out at them from among the trees. Instead of making chase to catch him, Mr. Cherry stood still and beckoned to him. This gave the native courage, who, seeing also that no injury had been done to the village, after a little hesitation, advanced. One of Jack's crew was a Malay, who could speak not only his own language, but that of many of the surrounding tribes. He had no difficulty in entering into conversation with the native, who asserted that his people had taken the British for pirates, and had run away in consequence. To prove his sincerity, he offered to pilot the boats to the chief haunts of the pirates. As there was no reason to doubt him, his offer was accepted. He merely requested time to equip himself for the expedition. He entered one of the houses, and soon returned with a couple of creases stuck into his sash, and a sword by his side and the whole party, embarking once more, proceeded on their voyage. Their volunteer pilot was a merry, talkative fellow. What his real name was, it was difficult to make out exactly. So Jack gave him that of Hoddy Doddy, which it sounded very like, and he at once readily answered to it. All that day they sailed on without seeing anything of the pirates. They began at last to fancy that Hoddy Doddy was deceiving them, 
but he entreated them not to despair, and promised, by noon the next day at farthest, to bring them in sight of the marauders. They brought up at night, in a sheltered bay, where the water was as smooth as a mill-pond. Jack and Dare grew very sentimental, as they leaned back in the stern sheets of Mr. Cherry's boat, where all the officers had collected to smoke their cigars, and looked up into the dark sky, sprinkled with stars innumerable. What they said need not be repeated. "'Come, lads, dismount from your pegasus, and turn in and get a little sleep,' cried their commanding officer. "'We've a hard day's work before us to-morrow, I suspect.' This warning brought their thoughts back to the business in which they were engaged, and returning to their respective boats, those not on watch were very quickly wrapped in what, as Paddy said, might have been soft repose, if it wasn't that the planks were so mighty hard. They were awoke before dawn by a summons from Hoddy Doddy, who declared that there was sufficient light for him to pilot them, if they wished to proceed. The anchors were at once got up, and they pulled away along shore. By daylight they came to a broad channel some miles wide. Their pilot averred that they should find the pirate fleet across it. Away they dashed. A thin silvery mist hung over the ocean, sufficient, however, to conceal them from any one on the lookout from the opposite shore. Only here and there, as they approached, a few palm trees, rearing their heads above the mist, showed where the shore itself was. If the pirates only happen to be there, we shall catch them to a certainty shouted Paddy to Jack as they pulled rapidly on. Soon all were ordered to keep silence, and Hoddy Doddy was seen to be indulging in a variety of curious and somewhat violent gesticulations. Just then appeared the masts and yards of a whole fleet of Illinoon prahus. There could be no doubt that they were the pirates. Mr. Cherry had no necessity to order his followers to give way. The seamen laid their backs to the oars and made the boats fly, hissing through the water. They thought that they should take the enemy by surprise, but the sound of tom-toms beating, pistols being fired, and loud shouts showed them that the pirates were not asleep, and that they themselves had been heard, if not seen. Just then a puff of wind blew aside the mist, and exhibited some twenty prahus or more, drawn up in order of battle, and ready to receive them. A larger body than they were might have hesitated about attacking, Still, it did not enter the head of their gallant leader that it would be possible to retreat. He ordered Jack to attack on one wing, and a dare on the other, while he pulled for the centre of the fleet, firing his long gun as he did so. The pirates were evidently astonished at this bold proceeding, and at the way the shots pitched into them. Probably they thought that the boats they saw were only the advanced guard, and that a much stronger force was following. First one and then another cut their cables, and, getting out their long sweeps, pulled away on either hand. Some four or five stood to the southward, and Jack, in hot haste, followed them. Adair pursued nearly the same number round the north end of the island, while the main body, with whom Mr. Cherry was engaged, showed a disposition to run up a narrow inlet or channel, which appeared astern of them. Jack cheered on his men, and they, nothing loath, gave way with a will. Still the pirates showed that they possessed very fast heels, beside which they could kick, as the British found to their cost, and several shots from their stern guns struck the boat as she got nearer to them. A groan burst from the lips of one of the seamen. He pulled on, but Jack saw his hand suddenly let go his oar, and down he sank. Directly afterwards another poor fellow was hit. This loss considerably lessened the speed of the boat. Some little time also was occupied in placing the wounded men in the stern sheets and in looking to their wounds. End of chapter 23 Chapter 24 of The Three Midshipmen This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. The Three Midshipmen by William Henry Giles Kingston. Chapter 24 Hot Fighting With Jack Rogers had come little Harry Bevan, Jack, not believing that there would be any fighting, had got leave to bring his young charge with him. As the shots were flying thickly about, 
how gladly would he have shielded the young lad with his own body he wished that he could have ventured to stow him down at the bottom of the boat out of harm's way but he knew well enough that harry would not have remained there a minute had he done so not a thought that he himself might be hit crossed jack's mind his whole anxiety was for the young boy harry however seemed unconscious of the danger he was leaning over one of the wounded men assisting to bind up his arm when jack saw his hand drop powerless by his side when he fell forward jack caught him in time what is the matter harry he exclaimed are you hurt lad a strange pain about my shoulder and arm and neck he answered faintly oh i'm very sick rogers very sick jack saw that the boy's jacket was torn he cut away the cloth with his knife the blood how gushed out freely there was a desperate wound on the shoulder no woman could have dressed it with more care and gentleness did, did jack he poured some brandy and water down the lad's throat which might revive him though his suppressed groan showed that he was still in great pain many people would have given up the chase under these circumstances but jack rogers was not a fellow to do that he found however that he could do the enemy more damage by keeping out of the range of their guns and yet keep them within range of his miles were thus passed over as the sun rose the heat increased there was a breeze and the perahue profited by it by spreading all their sails but it did not serve to cool the air at length jack found that he had got round the island and greatly to his delight he saw the other portion of the pirate squadron followed closely by adair the two boats whirled soon alongside each other a council of war was held it was a question whether they should wait for their commander or pursue the enemy it was quickly decided that they should continue the chase there were groups of islands ahead and the chances were that if they did not follow the enemy they would escape among them so on they pulled the pirates fired as before though without doing any further damage the only person who seemed to wish to be elsewhere was queerface he jumped about and chattered incessantly then he would try and hide himself but he could not remain quiet but every time he heard a shot he popped up his head to see where it was going suddenly it grew perfectly calm again a lurid look came over the sky evidently there was going to be a change in the weather the pirates seemed to know what was about to occur there was an inlet in an island close at hand towards it they rapidly pulled jack and adair were about to follow when down upon them came a terrific squall which very nearly blew both their boats right over they happily got them before it and away they flew towards the island they had left to weather it was impossible the best chance of saving the boats was to beach them they prayed that there might be no rocks in the way but the fierce breath of the tornado was sweeping up a, such vast masses of foam into the air that they could see but a few fathoms before them side by side the two boats sprang on jack stood up as his boat rose on the top of a sea he saw the land close under her bows it appeared be ready lads to spring out and to carry our wounded shipmates up the beach he exclaimed the next instant the boat struck with a force which shattered her almost to pieces the seething foaming waters rushed round her and would have swept her off again had not her crew leaping out seized her gunwale and dragged her up the beach while the wounded men were carried to a spot where they were safe jack having placed little harry whom he carried in his arms in a place of safety looked anxiously round for terence the boat of the latter had received even greater damage but his people had escaped with their lives some of the provisions had however been washed out of her 
i fear we are on a very desolate island exclaimed adair as he came up to jack it was certainly a most unpromising spot there were a few palm trees to be seen here and there at a distance but of a stunted growth as if there was but little soil to nourish the roots while all around was sand and rock on hauling up the boats they were both discovered to be unseaworthy their stock of provisions was much reduced and what was worse most of their powder was spoilt and the boats guns rendered useless a very important loss in the neighbourhood of so numerous and vindictive an enemy the men had their muskets and cutlasses however and there was no doubt that they should the pirates attack them they would fight to the last the great hope was that the tornado which had driven them on shore might have treated their enemies in the same way we ought not to wish our enemies ill observed terence but i suppose that it would not be wrong to wish that they may be no better off than we are jack had nothing to say against this principle another source of anxiety was for mr cherry they had left him attacking a very superior force and even had he come off the victor how would his boat have withstood the tornado still no one despaired or even lost their spirits neither were they for a moment idle the men joked and laughed as much as ever especially at queerface who delighted to get on shore leaped and frolicked about in the highest glee jack and terence after a short consultation agreed as they could not get away it would be safer to fortify themselves in case the pirates should discover and attack them they were not long in selecting a spot among some rocks where by throwing up banks of sand and digging holes in which to shelter themselves they hoped that they might bid defiance to ten times their own number of enemies the tornado kept blowing very fiercely for most of the time at length when their work was far advanced it subsided considerably their labours were however not ended till nearly dark by which time it was again calm they made an awning with the boat's sails and were all glad to lie down and get some rest after the fatigues of the day the necessary guards having been placed to give notice of the approach of an enemy they prudently would not light a fire lest the light should be seen by the pirates who might be on the lookout for them jack's chief concern was for harry bevan the men bore their sufferings well though they groaned in their sleep as wounded men generally do even when not in much pain but their pulses kept up and their minds were collected jack and adair had gone to the highest point of rock in the neighbourhood to ascertain if they could if any enemy was near but far as their gaze could extend across the starlit ocean no vessel of any sort floated on its surface hoping that they might be left in peace till daylight and thus give longer time for mr cherry to rejoin them they returned to their encampment they found poor little harry talking away vehemently about people and circumstances of which they knew nothing relating undoubtedly to his far distant home his mind was wandering he thought jack was his mother and blessed him for all the care and kindness he was showing him he fancied however that adair was queer face and told him that he would rope ends him if he came near him a compliment paddy did not altogether approve of the worst part of the business was that they could do nothing for the poor boy they had no medicine and no notion of what to administer if they had any jack was afraid of giving more brandy so he let him have much water as he wanted to drink and by soothing words try to calm his mind and lull him to sleep at length dick needham who belonged to jack's boat woke up and entreated to be allowed to sit by the side of the poor little fellow who could wish for a more tender gentle nurse than a true-hearted british sailor can make when he's aware that grog 
however good in its way is not under all circumstances the very best of medicines that can be administered leaving harry therefore to needham's care jack and terence sat up talking for some time longer and making arrangements like wise commanders what under the various circumstances which might occur they would do at length they threw themselves on the ground and endeavoured to obtain a little rest in preparation for the work before them jack thought that he had been only a few minutes asleep when he started to his feet on hearing needham's voice what is it he exclaimed looking round it was daylight but a thick white mist hung over the sea the enemy are not far off i suspect sir answered needham who at that instant was entering the encampment my mind misgave me somehow and i went to the top of the rock before he could finish the sentence jack sprang on towards the place mentioned followed by terence who roused up the moment he heard jack's voice on reaching the top of the rock they cast their eyes eagerly seaward at first nothing but a mass of white mist could be seen jack thought that needham had been mistaken while however they were still in doubt a current of air it seemed blew off the top of the mist just as froth is blown from a mug of ale and the upper sails of a fleet of prahus appeared not a quarter of a mile from the shore the pirates must be looking for us exclaimed terence it will be fortunate if the mist continues and they slip by without pitching on us pitching into us you mean said jack with a laugh well if they find us out we must drive them off and hold our own till the frigate sends to look for us still as they are ugly customers we'll do our best to keep out of their sight in this strain the two midshipmen talked on for some time watching the movements of the prius now the fog closed around them now it lifted and exposed the sails to view they seemed to be gliding by the island yet they were unpleasantly near if the fog lifts they can scarcely fail to see us remarked terence then paddy we must fight it out to the last and i'm sure that you are of my opinion too said jack that i am jack cried adair wringing his hand but i say what is that i hear a splash of oars they listened there could be no doubt of it and their practice ears told them that it was not the stroke of british seamen the pirates it was too probable had set on shore and would land close to the very spot where the wreck of the boats lay they would in all probability betray them it could not be helped so they hurried back to the camp to prepare for whatever might happen as they passed along the beast they could still hear the sound of oars which was borne by a considerable distance over the calm water the men stood with their muskets in their hands ready for the attack even the wounded men begged to be propped up against the bank that they might get a shot at the enemy poor little harry had dropped off into a deep slumber and knew nothing of the preparations taking place needham volunteered to go down and watch behind a rock close down to the water so as to give the earliest notice of the approach of the pirate boats should they come on shore at that point they had not long to wait louder and more distinct grew the splashes of the oars presently needham came running up to the fort there are pretty nearly a dozen boats in he exclaimed you'll see them in a moment coming out of the fog they can't very well miss finding us very well said jack coolly they'll be sorry that they did find us that's all as needham had said in another minute the long black hulls of the pirates boats appeared through the fog and being run up on the beach the crew leaped out of them the swarthy savages with sharp creases by their sides and long jingles in their hands looked about on every side and seemed surprised at not finding an enemy 
they examined the boats and then looked about again so well was the fort constructed among the rocks that in the fog they did not discover it they began to scatter about and they were evidently persuaded that the english had made their escape across the island at length three or four malays wandered close up to the fort they stood for a moment as if transfixed and then as it beamed on their comprehension what it really was they beat a retreat shouting to their companions the seamen were for firing at the intruders but jack ordered them not to throw a shot away or to fire till they were attacked they had not long to wait the whole band of malays quickly collected and with glittering creases in their hands rushed on to the attack now boys give it to them cried jack and terence repeated the order almost in the same breath for he knew that it was coming half the seamen only fired and then began again to load the other half waited till the first were ready and the malays had got close up to the bank the latter fancying probably that only a few had firearms came on courageously fire boys cried jack quietly the seamen jumped up and the pirates not expecting so warm a reception wandered and fell back leaving several dead and wounded close to the fort jack and terence began to hope that they would retreat altogether but encouraged by their chiefs once more they were seen to come on at the same time several more boats reached the shore jack and terence could not conceal from themselves that they were in a dangerous position with loud horrible shrieks the malays rushed up to the fort the noise of the firing woke up little harry and just as the pirates had a second time reached the embankment jack found him standing close to him his clothes bespattered with blood and his face looking pale as a sheet of paper for a moment jack thought it was the ghost of a young charge but he had no time to think about it for the next instant the enemy were close to them again and again the english sailors fired and kept the enemy back but the pirates so far outnumbered them that there seemed but little hope of their ultimate success again by their unflinching bravery they drove the enemy back the malays however kept up a hot fire on them when they got to a distance and several of the english were hit and unable longer to fight the two poor fellows were killed outright the fog now cleared and jack saw that the prehas themselves were drawing in with the land with their own scanty numbers diminishing and those of the enemy increasing jack and terence could not help acknowledging that their case was desperate still when the enemy once more came on they received them with as firm hearts and hearty a cheer as before for a short time there was a cessation of firing queerface who had wisely got into a hole looked out to see what had happened at that moment a bird was seen flying towards the fort to the surprise of all it pitched close to queerface who seemed delighted to see it adair turned round why he exclaimed there is polly where can she have come from it was a question no one could answer the boats had gone off to the prahas and now returned with more men with terrific shrieks and cries of vengeance the malays rushed towards the gallant little band of englishmen resolved to destroy them End of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of the three midshipmen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon the three midshipmen by william 
henry giles kingston chapter twenty five in desperate condition the malay pirates surrounded the fort uttering the loudest shrieks and cries in the hope of terrifying the defenders but they did not know what british seamen were made of and in spite of the fierce and terrific looks of the enemy jack and his little band stood fast prepared to receive the onslaught poor harry bevan had sunk to the ground not through fear but weakness and jack had placed himself over his body determined to defend him as long as he himself had life or strength he felt and looked not a little like a lion prepared to do battle for her young jack had now grown into a very strong fine young man he was not very tall but he had broad shoulders and an expansive chest and now as he stood cutlass in hand with a profusion of light hair streaming back from his honest sunburnt countenance he was the picture of a true british sailor and might well have been likened to the noblest type of the king of beasts adair was not a whit behind him in courage though his physical powers were not so great what hope was there though for them and their gallant men at that moment there appeared but very little both of them knew that braver savages than the malays were not to be found jack as he stood there with his muscular arm bared and his sharp weapon in his hand did not put his trust in either he knew and felt that the arm of one alone who is mighty to save could preserve him and his companions and with deep earnestness and perfect faith he lifted up his heart to heaven and prayed that assistance might be sent them the british seamen returned the shrieks of the malays with shouts of defiance and kept up a rapid fire as they came on now their weapons cross there is the loud sounding clash of steel the sharp crack of muskets and pistols the shouts and shrieks of the combatants there is the thick smoke from the firearms mixed with the mist rapid flashes of flame and all the other sounds and appearances of a desperate struggle still though the pirates hem them closely round the seamen stood as before boldly at bay and no impression was made on their front jack cried adair in the middle of the fight i don't think polly came here for nothing hold on for a short time and we shall be relieved depend on it she and the monkey have been talking away together and master queerface looks as if he knew all was right i rather suspect that adair was allowing his imagination to run away with him or that he spoke thus to keep up the spirits of his men still the appearance of polly was very extraordinary and could only be accounted for by supposing that the frigate was not far off or that she had accompanied mr cherry and that his boat was in the neighbourhood the idea might have encouraged the seamen to still further resistance but the malays pressed them hard and overwhelmed with numbers it appeared as if their fate was sealed even jack began to fear that this was the case he saw that the fire of his men began to slacken and the dreadful report ran among them that their ammunition was almost expended what is to be done rogers said adair in jack's ear trust in heaven terence answered jack warding off a blow which a malay who had leaped forward made at his head 
the next moment the savage rolled over a lifeless corpse down the embankment for another minute the desperate struggle continued with unabated fury then a sound was heard which made the hearts of the british seamen leap within their bosoms it was the loud report of a heavy gun which echoed among the rocks the seamen answered it with a hearty cheer for no guns but those of their own ship could give forth that sound another and another followed at the same time the breeze which the frigate had brought up blew away the mist and just above the rocks her topsails could be seen as she stood after the melee prayers the pirates saw her too if they would save their vessels and their lives they knew that there was not a moment to be lost at a sign from their chiefs as if a blast of wind had suddenly struck them before the english knew what they were about they rushed away like a heap of chaff before the gale jack and terence knowing their cunning nature and fancying that they might rally again hesitated to follow and kept back their men they are off at length cried terence hurrah my lads let's after them jack did not spring forward at once he had not forgotten for a moment his young charge he knew that driven to desperation the malays were very likely to run amuck and if they found him to kill him he felt sure that he would only be safe if he had him with him stooping down therefore he seized the little fellow in his arms and holding him as much as possible behind his back he sprang on and overtaking his companions made chase after the retreating malays the other wounded men in the excitement of the fight had forgotten their hurts and were pursuing with the rest queerface and polly had therefore no fancy to be left behind so off they set also though they took care to keep in the rear of their friends the malays had reached the beach and some were swimming and others wading off to their boats when the two midshipmen and their followers got up with them all were too eager to escape to attempt to offer any resistance jack had to recollect that they really were most atrocious robbers or he could scarcely have brought himself to allow his men to fire on them not many shots however were fired for the last cartridge in their pouches was expended happily the malays were in too great a hurry to be off to turn and let fly at them the frigate under all sail was coming round the point on the left hand while Lepreus was endeavouring to get away out of the range of her shot to the right or south side of the island they were catching it however pretty severely and more than one appeared to be in a sinking condition the midshipmen were now eager to try and get their own boats afloat but they were in an utterly unfit state for launching so all they could do was to make signals to the frigate that she might return and take them off after she had destroyed the pirates this there was very little doubt she would do in the eagerness of the chase however jack bethought him that those on board would very likely not observe their signals never mind cried adair as a bright thought struck him we'll send polly off she'll carry our message a note was accordingly written on a leaf of a pocket-book and being secured under polly's wing adair lifted her up and showing her the frigate gave her a shove off towards it 
she seemed to know exactly what was expected of her for giving one glance only round at her friends away she darted towards the ship they watched her anxiously till she was lost to sight still they had little doubt about her reaching her destination and in the course of a very few minutes their anxiety was relieved by their seeing a flag run up to the masthead of the frigate while a gun was fired to leeward she however passed before them and soon disappeared again on the other side of the island a rapid and continuous fire told them what she was about jack and adair would gladly have gone round to see what was occurring but the distance was considerable over hot burning sand and rocks and they would not leave their wounded and tired men to gratify their curiosity they very soon remembered after the excitement of the work in which they had been engaged was over that they had not breakfasted so all hands who could move about set to work to collect sticks to light a fire it soon blazed up and speedily coffee and cocoa were boiling and bits of meat were roasting away at the ends of ramrods and sticks the poor wounded men when the excitement was over began to feel not hunger but the pain of their hurts and several sank to the ground unable to move their shipmates did their best for them and rigged an awning with the boat's sails under which they were placed some of the men wandered away and brought back a supply of cocoa nuts the milk of which afforded a deliciously cooling beverage to the poor fellows jack meantime was tending to his young charge with as much care and tenderness as a mother would a child at length he was rewarded by seeing harry come to himself the boy looked up in his face and the first words he uttered were we've beat them rogers have we hurrah hurrah yes harry answered jack it is all right the enemy have taken to flight and we shall soon i hope be on board the frigate but here you will be the better for some cocoa take this jack sat down under the shade of the sail and needham having brought him a mug of cocoa he broke some biscuit into it and stirring it up while the boy's head rested on his knee he fed him as he would have done a baby harry who had soon again relapsed into apparent unconsciousness opened his lips and ate a little with a dreamy expression of countenance as if he himself fancied that he was still a baby being fed by his nurse the food however jack saw was doing him good for the color slowly returned to his cheeks and his pulse began to beat more regularly he will be all right soon exclaimed jack to adair it is wonderful what nature will do if we don't play tricks and take liberties with her harry bevan though delicately nurtured was of a sound constitution which he had not injured by either drinking or smoking or by any other means as many poor silly lads do thinking they are behaving in a manly way by so doing had he been inclined to do so jack rogers would have taken very good care to prevent him thus it was however that he did not succumb to the fearful injury he had received still jack was very anxious to get him safe on board and under the doctor's care time went on and still the frigate did not appear adair proposed starting off to the other side of the island to ascertain what had become of her when a boat was seen rounding the point she is mr cherry's boat was the cry hurrah hurrah with hearty cheers mr cherry was welcomed on shore he had had a severe struggle 
and had lost two of his men killed and three wounded but had succeeded in putting the pirates to flight his boat was not large enough to carry all the party but he had one of his carpenter's crew with him and some tools and after a little examination tom jimlet declared that he could patch up one of the boats so as to make her in a fit condition to launch all hands helping and with the aid of some planks from the other boat this was done and at length the two boats were on the water and on their way to look for the frigate when mr cherry heard how long it was since she had passed the island he began to be somewhat anxious about her the boats however were so heavily laden that they could not make much speed to satisfy themselves as to what had happened the men did their best and it was wonderful how they kept up their spirits under the hot boiling sun which as patty observed was roaring away like a furnace right over their heads no sooner had they rounded the island than the sound of a gun booming over the smooth waters reached their ears at slow intervals another and another followed the ship is in distress observed adair to jack what can have happened give way lads cried jack seizing the stroke oar and bending his back to it with a will it was the only answer he made to adair's remark little harry looked up at him with admiration and affection and the men exerted themselves more than ever on they pulled hour after hour no one proposed resting even to take any refreshment except a piece of biscuit which the men chewed during the intervals that they were relieved at the oars there she is at last cried jack standing up on the stern sheets he took a steady look at her through his glass so did mr cherry through his her sails were set but with heavy hearts they both agreed that from her appearance she must be hard and fast on shore and if on a coral reef there was too great a probability that she might not be got off again End of chapter twenty five recording by john brandon